Amen. Would you consider uh, how much uh, Scripture encourages us to have a, a heart of joy? How God wants to deal. I think the emotion of a believer should be one of joy. Romans 5 or 4 verse 7 says this. How joyful are those whose lawless acts have been forgiven and whose sins are covered. How joyful is the man who will never, the Lord will never charge with sin. The psalmist declares in Psalm 33 verse 1 this truth. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. Psalm 66 verse 1 says this. Shout joyfully to God all the earth. And the reoccurring theme throughout Psalms, throughout the Old Testament, throughout Philippians, is one of joy. It's one of rejoice. We are to sing with joy. We are to shout with joy. We are to give with joy. We are to worship with joy. We are to live with joy. There is joy out there. God wants us to have great joy. One of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. What happens when you... Re- when you trust God, what happens when you lean upon the Spirit's uh, direction in your life? What happens when you live moment by moment in the dependency saying, God, your will be done. God, your, your desires is my desires. God, I'm going to follow you. The outgrowth of a believer's life when we are following Jesus and responding to Jesus is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is not testing your determination. It's testing your Spirit's dependency. And when you depend upon the Spirit... The Bible says that out of your life, Galatians 5, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, whew, and self-control. God gives joy. And yet we ask today, is joy possible in 2018? Is it possible with all of your past and with all your in-laws, can you have joy? I hit too close to home, I'm sorry. Can you have joy? Is joy, lasting joy, there for you today? I want to look at just the reality of joy. The emotion, I believe, that should be characterized by our hearts, joy. So let's look together today. If you have a Bible, open it with me to Luke chapter 10, verse 13. We continue on Sunday mornings, walking the book of Luke, pursuing Jesus, looking at who Jesus is and what does King Jesus want from us. If you have our church app, you can click on the notes section and you can follow along uh, with what's on the screen as well. But Luke chapter 10 verse 13, we catch midstream. This is Jesus speaking and here's what Jesus says. Woe to you, Karazi. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the miracles that were done in you have been done in Tyre and Sidon. They would have repented long ago, sitting in ashcloth and sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No. You will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. Verse 17. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Now our text today is the end of Jesus' instructions for 72 individuals. These 72 followers Jesus sent out as missionaries to go to towns and to go to villages that Jesus would later come to. They were to heal. Um, They were to proclaim the kingdom of God is near. And so in our text, Jesus gave very specific instructions. And we see in our text this principle that all believers are missionaries. If you're a Christian today... God's desire for your life is to be on mission with the king. Um, you are, we, we have a, a missionary calling for every single one of us. Uh, today, uh, thankful to have some missionaries uh, that uh, Eddie Paul's class supports from Japan. And we are thankful for their sacrifices, the carnies, for their, uh, and where God is working in Japan. And yet, uh, while I, I love missionaries, as a church we love missionaries, the truth is we are missionaries too. Amen? Good. And yet we see here, in the text here, we see that there are specific principles to these 72, yet I think that rings for us all. Jesus tells us that the mission is difficult. It's like lamb among wolves. It's, it's urgent. You don't have time for, for um, packing bags. You don't have time for extra sandals. But it's, it's, a, it's an urgent mission. It's serious business. 
Jesus tells them that it involves trusting God. They had to trust that God was at work here, that God would do a great work among these villages. And they had to live surrendering their lives to God's reign, surrendering their lives to the kingdom of God. And we come to our text, we see another spiritual truth. Jesus says that they go as representatives of Jesus. How individual towns, how individuals respond isn't so much how they respond to the missionaries, it's how much they respond to Jesus. If they listen to them, then they're listening to Jesus. If they reject the message, ultimately they're rejecting Jesus. And we see a truth in here I don't want to miss. I think my friends, Jehovah's Witness, miss this truth. I think our Jewish friends miss this truth. Jesus says, the last part of 16, whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. See, we see some, a unique tie between the, the ministry of Jesus, the mission of Jesus, and God the Father. We see a great unity there. You can't say, I love God and hate Jesus, or I love Jesus and hate God, but, but their ministry and mission is very much entangled and togetherness. And we see that truth here repeated again here in Scripture. But we see the emotion of these 72 when they return. Look with me, verse 17. The Bible says, they returned with, woo joy. Joy. Man, you want joy today? You want joy? What's that old children's song? Down in your heart? There you go, so you know that song. You want joy today? I think I want to see two things in God's word today. I believe that joy is found in obedience to Christ. Joy is found in obedience in King Jesus. They returned with joy. They had obeyed God. They trusted God. They went. They, they, they healed. They spoke the message of God. And they came back with joy. They may have left uneasy. They may have left unsure. They may have left unsettled. But when they returned, they were no longer uneasy. They were no longer unsure. They were no longer unsettled. They returned with joy. And I believe that joy is tied to their obedience in Christ. It is a joy to trust God. It is a joy to sing to God. It is a joy to serve in the name of God. It is a joy to obey God. And even when God asks us to take steps of faith that are uncertain and uneasy and scary, it is still a joy to follow King Jesus. But I want you to notice something in our text. Notice the costliness of disobedience. Notice the costliness of rejection. Notice the costliness of sin. See, Jesus identifies in verse 13 through verse 15 towns that rejected his ministry, that rejected the message of Jesus. He identifies two towns, Chorazin, Chorazin and Bethsaida. Chorazin and Bethsaida were both on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. There would be towns that would have been around that have witnessed maybe the feeding of the 5,000. They would have seen the, the blind man who had sight. These were some towns that some of the disciples came from. And they had heard Jesus' message, they had heard, they had watched his ministry, they had seen dramatic things happen, and yet they didn't respond. Yet they rejected Jesus, and they rejected the gospel. And Jesus says, woe to you, and then he looks at two cities on the Mediterranean coast that was, are in the Old Testament, that are unrighteous, wicked cities. He says, you're worse than Tyre and Sidon, these are... Two wicked cities that were noticed in the Old Testament um, by Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, and Zechariah. All of them prophesied about these cities and their wickedness and their rebellion against God. And yet Jesus says that these present cities are worse than these, these unrighteous cities in the Old Testament. Now, don't, there's an analogy here. He's not trying to say there's different levels of judgment. But Jesus is talking about these present cities. He's talking about their, the current generation's rejection has gone further than previous generations and previous cities' rejection. And then he lumps in Capernaum. Capernaum is Peter's hometown. Remember Capernaum is where Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. It's where Jesus did a lot of men. Jesus preached in the synagogue of Capernaum. He says, Capernaum, don't think that you're going to go to heaven as a town you've rejected, as a town you've not embraced. Your destination is not heaven, but it is hell. It is eternal judgment. Now, why is Jesus talking about the judgment? Why is Jesus talking about the condemnation of these three cities for their disobedience? Because I believe in this truth. To reject the kingdom of God is most seriousness of sin. Hear that again. 
to reject the kingdom of God, to reject God's message, to reject God's will in your life is the most serious of sins. And so Jesus is talking about three different cities that are all facing judgment, that are all facing condemnation because they have rejected him, they have rejected his message, and it is serious business. I, don't, I think we miss the seriousness of our rejection when we reject the Lord. God doesn't wink at sin. God doesn't excuse sin. God doesn't say it's no big deal. God sees sin as serious business. I think as a generation, we laugh at sin, we ignore it, we watch it, we excuse it, and we put up with it way too much. See, the truth is, the, the bad news is, God is a God of love, but the truth, the bad news is, God is also a God of condemnation. We only think sometimes maybe God's too harsh. We only think maybe sometimes God's too restrictive. He's too old-fashioned. He's too outdated. And we think that living otherwise will bring us joy, and it won't bring us joy. It brings us brokenness and sadness and heartache. I was at a funeral recently. Um, it wasn't a family I knew. They needed a pastor, and so um, I helped them and did a funeral. I didn't know the individual who had deceased. And they played songs about the man before and, and after I spoke. And I think the song before I spoke was a Frank Sinatra song, I Did It My Way. And they were celebrating that this was a character who did it his way. And while they celebrated, I sat there and thought, oh no, this is not good. It is not good to flaunt, we did it our way. Doing life our way does not bring lasting joy. It does not bring peace. It never satisfies. It doesn't bring joy. And sometimes we want to say excuses like, I know what God wants, but, but, but I'm in love. I, I know what God wants, but, but I'm lonely. I, I know God's will for my life, and I know God's expectations, but, but I've got kids. I, I know what God wants, but everyone else is doing it as if those things justify our disobedience. And yet, friends, I believe it is foolish, it is the epitome of foolishness to know what God wants us to do, to know God's will, to know God's plan for our life, and choose to do otherwise. Here are towns who had heard the message, who had, heard, who had seen the ministry, and yet they chose to do otherwise, and Jesus says, eh -eh, ain't going to cut it, not good enough. And they missed the joy. Church, can I ask you a personal question? Is sin, rebellion, disobedience causing you today to miss out the joy that God wants to offer you? Is there any sin in your life, any disobedience in your life, any rebellion in your life that you're unwilling to do what God clearly wants you to do? You're unwilling to let it go? You're unwilling to take that next step of faith that you're missing the joy that God offers? That's what happens in these three towns. They missed it. And yet while we notice the costliness of disobedience, of sin, and rebellion, I want you not to miss the beauty of the text. Notice the byproduct of obedience. What happens when we obey the message of God, the, the will of God, the plan of God, it brings, woohoo, joy. Joy. It's verse 17, the 72 returned with joy. Yet these towns, though they didn't respond, these 72 did respond. They went. They clearly delivered the message of God. They clearly followed the plan of God. They obeyed. They went. They took steps of faith. And they had joy in their hearts, not because they came back with souvenirs. Joy not because they got to eat good fried chicken. Well, that might bring me joy. Joy was not because of the towns they visited. There was joy because they had obeyed the plan of God, the will of God, the message of God, what God wanted them to do in their lives. See, I, I believe Joy's not there in stuff. Joy's not there in people. Joy's there in Christ in obedience. I think sometimes we miss joy because we chase after new stuff, new cars, new houses, new technology stuff. I think we miss joy because we play the comparison game too much. They have it, I don't. They did this, I didn't. And we play the comparison game. We miss out how God's blessed. And I think we miss joy when we're on our tablets, iPhones, and TVs, and technology too much. I think there's a direct proportion that the more time you spend on social media, the less joy you have, and I'm stopping there because I'm stepping on my toes there. 
But notice the byproduct of obedience. So I think there's a spiritual truth at play. There's an old hymn that says this, turn, I won't sing, your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. The things of this world will go strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. I believe there is something, I believe that truth of that hymn is real. That when we look toward Jesus, when we look toward his will for our lives, we look to obedience in Jesus, it does bring great joy to our hearts. How can Paul write in Philippians 3, finally rejoice in the Lord my brothers? He's in prison, he's been, he's been beaten near to death, he's been whooped many times for the gospel, and Paul writes, finally rejoice. How can he find joy? Because he, he had turned to Jesus. He was following Jesus. He was obeying Jesus. There's joy there. It's the byproduct of obedience. I remember one of our church members, this quote won't leave me. It says, we are not joyful for cancer, but we are joyful for God through cancer. And I believe the byproduct of obedience is joy. Now notice with me, I've seen this in your life. I've seen you on mission trips. We've been at hard days. We've been dog tired. And yet there's joy at the end of the day as you've been sharing the gospel and been obedient to the Lord. I've seen this with you on block parties, living nativities. We've, we've worked hard to share the gospel in a unique way to our town. And there's joy as we've worked hard to love others. I, I've seen this, heard it this morning with a, a church member talking about his D group. It's a D group that I think after they, they study the Bible, they shoot guns together. And as he was sharing about his D group, I can hear it's just great joy as he talked about being a disciple maker. There is joy. It, it's found not in looking for joy. It's found not in focusing on joy. But when we look to Jesus, when we obey Jesus, when we, when we respond to Jesus' call in our life, even among the hardship, there is joy in our heart as we live to please Jesus. And the 72, they might have went out uneasy. They might have went out uncertain, but they returned with joy because they had obeyed the message of Jesus. And church, if you're missing some joy today, maybe the word is, man, when we obey Jesus and follow Jesus, he brings that to our life. Notice the second way to find joy. There's joy not only in obedience in Jesus, but I believe the scripture teaches us there's joy in salvation. Look with me again at verse 17. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, to trample um, and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing at all will harm you. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, I want you to see, when these 72, they came back, they were like, let the good times roll. I mean, they were on cloud nine. And they were happy because God had given them power um, to heal, power over spirits, over demons. Now, I think it's quite unique that in Luke 9, they were saying, Jesus, stop, the, stop an individual for doing this. But now that God had given them power in this day to, to, as a demonstration of God at work, they were like, let the good times roll. And Jesus was like, you're joyful for the wrong things. And he looks back and he sees the important theology. He sees the downfall of Satan. Now, Scripture teaches us that there was a time that, that Satan, Lucifer, was one of the angels. He and, a, he and a third of the angels kind of tried to make life about themselves instead of the glory of God. And so God kicked Satan and a third of the angels out of heaven. We call them now demons, fallen angels. And yet here it talks about the authority over things that, that try to stop the gospel, over the demonic. Jesus says, I've given you authority over that. Now, as he looks about at Satan's fall, he could also be talking about the ministry of these missionaries as they go to towns. And we see the kingdom of God expand and the kingdom of Satan shrink. Maybe he looks at the work that Jesus will do. You know, when Jesus dies on the cross and he rises from the grave, he gives Satan a death blow. Sin is defeated, and Satan is defeated. And maybe he looks to the great battle of Armageddon when Jesus will return. 
and that great battle after the millennium, when that happens, there is no fight. King Jesus is victorious. He is the winner. And so he looks at defeated as Satan, it looks, at, it looks at Satan's defeat. And I don't want to make too little of Satan or too much of the demonic. I think John MacArthur is right. Satan continues his efforts to make sin less offensive, heaven less appealing, hell less horrific, and the gospel less urgent. Satan is at work in the world we live in today. But he reminds the followers, he reminds these missionaries who went on the missionary call the ultimate joy. It's not about the power I've given you over the demonic, over the demons, but the great joy is this. Again, see it in verse 20. However, don't rejoice that your spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. See, here's the great joy here. It's not about power. It's not about demonstrations of God, but the great joy here is that to have your name written in heaven. Now, he's talking about Revelation 20, having your name written in the book of life. If your name is written in the book of life, it got there not because you're good looking. It got there not because you can make fried chicken. It got there not because you've been kind. It got there not because you gave. It only got there because Jesus has saved you. The only way that any of us can have our names written in the book of life It's for us to turn from our sins and turn to the the glorious Jesus and ask him to be our Savior. And when he does, the Bible says, God writes in permanent ink, unerasable, irrasable. It ain't getting marked out. That's Georgia words. God writes your name in the book of life, Satan, nothing can thwart that, not even you yourself. It is put there in permanent. And yet here Jesus is talking about the glory of The joy of having your name written in heaven. The glory, the joy of having salvation. See, joy is a characteristic of salvation. When people are saved, sometimes we say things like, well, who would be excited? Who should you tell that would be excited you got saved? And they'd say, well, my mama, my family, my friends, and we often say call them. Heaven, if the truth of Scripture is, when you get saved, the angels throw a party. Heaven gets excited when you get saved. But so should our hearts. Think about it. When God saved you, woo I got saved. You know, I don't understand how Christians can be yours. I just don't get it. And I know life is hard. I know there are seasons that are hard. I'm not discounting that at all. But I don't know about Christians who who the characteristic of their life is, I don't know, it's a horrible day today, it's raining, I guess I'll just stay in my PJs and go to Walmart, (laughs) too far, too far, too far, too far, (laughs) too far, too far, I lost you, I'm sorry. I don't get how Christians can be yours. I don't get how Christians can look like they've been sucking on lemons all day long. I, I just, I just, I, it, I, I can't fathom it. I believe that the longer that you've been a Christian, the more joy that should be in your life. The longer you've had a chance to co- contemplate what Christ has done and a wretch like you, the longer you've been able to think about and know about the grace of God that took to save you, the longer that you know of your eternal destination, but only by the grace of God that you got a different eternal destination. If you've been saved, the longer you've been saved, the more joyful that ought to be in your heart. It is the characteristic. I love what First Peter writes. As Peter thinks about his salvation, he calls it the, um, he says, rejoice with the inexpressible and glorious joy, knowing that God's at work to bring the fruit of our salvation. The inexpressible and glorious joy. Think about that. It is inexpressible and it is glorious to think about what Christ has done in saving us. And when we do, the overflow ought to be, woo The Pentecostals ought not have something over us. When we think about the joy, man, wow, it is joyful there. Think about it. When we realize that our name is written in heaven. See, no matter what happens in life, we have reasons to rejoice if our name is written in heaven. No matter what happens in life, you have a reason to rejoice if your name is written in heaven. I mean, think about it. Realize who you are without Christ. 
Without Christ, the Bible says we are dead in our trespasses. We're not pretty good old boys. We are dead, deserving death. The Bible says in Romans that we are turned away. We are worthless. There is no one that is good. Our best is filthy rags. And yet God, by his grace and his mercy, saved us. Man, remember what Christ has done to save us. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates or proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, while we were rebellious, Christ died for us. Why did Christ die? Remember that. He died because I was a rotten, am a rotten sinner. Without his help, I'm going to hell. Remember what Christ has done. The um, angels say in Bethlehem, to bring the news to the shepherds that Christ was born. He said, I bring you tidings of great joy that will be for all the people. For today in the town of David, a Savior has been born for you. It's not just the message of angels, but it's the message of the gospel. Joy isn't reserved for Christmas. Joy is reserved for every believer. It, it, is, it is when we remember what Christ has done, it brings great joy. And I think this is quite a good truth to remember. The word joy in verse 17, the the Greek word for joy is the same root for grace. We have joy because of the grace of God in saving us. Not because I earned it, not because I deserved it, but because God showed his love in sending his son to die on the cross for me. I get salvation and I get joy. When we come to know the salvation of God, it brings joy. But reflect on the beauty of heaven. We think about our salvation. The psalmist writes, I can only imagine. Church, I can't even imagine. And yet when I try to imagine, I look at scriptures like 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, where it talks about when Christ returns and the church is caught up with him in the air. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says this truth, and we will always be with the Lord. Now think about that. For you who have been saved, for you who God has taken your sins, and he nailed them on the cross with Jesus. And for you who've been saved by the Lord, what does your future hold? You will always be with the Lord. Think about that. Next time the Cardinals lose to the Braves, you think, oh, it's me. Next time your roof leaks and the cupboard is bare. Next time you feel lonely at night, remember your future. This is but for a moment, but we will always be with the Lord. We will always be with the Lord. I think there's joy. It's the characteristic of a salvation. When you remember what Christ has done, you reflect on, reflect on your past, you reflect on your future. Man, there is great, great joy there, my friends. There's a preacher. I was reading that for a giving campaign. He called, the nickname for the day they were giving, he called it Share the Joy Sunday. On that Sunday, they wanted people to share how God had blessed them by giving to the building campaign. I thought, hey, that's a great idea. But to be theologically accurate, it should be share the joy every day. Think about it. If you've had your sins forgiven, if Christ has touched your life, if you've been saved by the Lord, isn't today the day to share the joy? Isn't tomorrow the day to share the joy? Isn't next Thursday the day to share the joy? You don't have, I mean, I think our life is about sharing the joy. It's about reflecting to others, living love, sharing the gospel, making disciples. Because not because I ought to, but because it is the joy of my heart because of what King Jesus has done for me. I got to watch last night. I'm a proud parent. I've seen your grand, grand baby's picture, so bear with me. I got to watch my son ride on a Benton fire truck. I didn't grow, when I grew up, we didn't ride the people on fire trucks. I've watched some of your kids ride on fire trucks and thought, that's pretty cool. But it's not as cool as when your son's on the fire truck. When I watched my son on the fire truck, I don't think he was as impressed with it as I was. I was like, woohoo! Get the fire trucks! Now, I want you to, I want to know what do 41 year old men have to do to get on the fire trucks? <laughs> what do preachers have to do? It was a joy for me as a father to watch a son as a part of a team and their perseverance and how God blessed. But even greater joy, more infinite joy, is the result of thinking about that God would save a wretch like me. May we not get over that. 
See, sometimes I think we miss joy because we look at the wrong stuff. We, we look with our head down, looking at this world. And maybe we need to look with our head up, thinking about the glories of heaven. Driving back from um, Peoria yesterday, and my daughter and I were singing Christmas songs. Don't judge us. I know, awful early. We were singing about Batman smells and Robin and different things. It reminds me of this Christmas song. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Yeah, I'll stop singing. I know that that's not so joyful. But that's more than just a Christmas song. That is the truth of life. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Church today, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're struggling with. I I don't know your life. The Lord knows that. Today, if you're missing joy, it could be because there's disobedience in your life. It could be because of sin. It could be because you're failing to go where God's clearly said go. And if so, don't wait another day to get right with the Lord. Today, if you're missing joy, maybe you're looking down and not looking up, thinking about the glories of heaven. Joy is a byproduct of obedience. Joy is a characteristic of salvation. Today, if you're missing joy, maybe it's because you don't have Christ. See, without Christ reigning in your life, without Christ as your king, without Christ as your savior, everything that the world offers won't satisfy. You can change spouses, you can change jobs, you can change cars, you can change what's for supper. It won't satisfy, only Christ does. And when you have Christ, you have joy, joy, joy. Church, do you have joy? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the joy of just worshiping you today, the joy of your word, the joy of you. And Lord, I pray, Lord, today for some that come today with broken hearts, some that come today hurting, some that come today with stress, that God, that you, in a way that only your spirit and word can, that you would breathe joy into their lives. That you'd remind them, Father, of just the joys of your promises, the joys of of you, the joys of your truths, the joys of your relationship. And you'd bring back the joy. And yet, Father, I pray today, Lord, for some, Lord, who are missing out of joy because of sin, disobedience, failure to obey you, God, that you would convict their hearts today. And you would lead them to repentance. If God's convicted you of something that's robbing you of joy, we just ask, Lord, in this holy moment, friends, to... For God to forgive you and help, ask God to help you to repent from that, turn from that. And friend, maybe you're here today if you recognize God's spoken to you. And you know today that you don't have joy, true joy in your life because you don't have Christ there. Uh, you know about Jesus, but you don't have Jesus as your Savior. You know today, you'd be, if you died, you'd be like one of those towns. You wouldn't go to heaven, you'd go to hell. Because you've never turned to Christ. You've not been saved. Today, if Christ has spoken to you about your salvation, you know that you need to be saved. Will you settle that today? There's no magic words to pray. It's a reflection of your heart. It's a heart that says, God, I don't want my sin anymore. I want you. So if that's you today, will you in the quiet of the moment just pray and ask God to save you? Maybe today you want to ask God to forgive you of your sins. Maybe you want to thank God for dying on the cross and rising from the grave. And maybe you just want to say, God, save me. The Bible says everyone who calls upon him, Lord, they will be saved. Will you ask God to save you? He'll do that. God, help us to trust you. Help us to obey you. Help us to follow you. Help us, oh God, to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, we come to our invitation time. Time we invite you to respond to the Lord Jesus. What would please God for you to do today? Maybe today you're going to sing of your desire to follow Him. So, second, stand and sing. Maybe today there's something on your heart that you want to seek God's guidance, seek God's help, seek God's forgiveness, seek God's counsel. So, we invite you in a second to come to the altar and kneel and pray. Maybe today God's moving upon your heart for this to be your church family. If you're a Christian, we love to just walk down the aisle, we stand and just say, Pastor, I want to join. I want this to be my church family. Or maybe today you just ask Christ to save you. And we'd love to celebrate with that. We, we're going to throw a party. 
you ask Christ to save you, we invite when we stand to walk down the aisle and say, Pastor, I got saved or I want to get saved. We're going to embarrass you. We do want to have a counselor share with you about next steps. If God has spoken, will you respond to him? We stand together and say, you come, God. All your ways are good. All your ways are good. I will trust. seven, eight years. That's about as long as I've been here, Wayne. Um, he looks sharp. He looks like a preacher today. Uh, uh, Wayne uh, makes me very happy. He attended our new members class uh, uh, just recently, and Wayne came today and said, hey, I want to become a member of Emmanuel. We celebrate that. Yeah, amen, amen. <laughs> Wayne, today's a good day. It brings me some joy to see you uh, join with us today. It's a good, good day. I'm going to have you go with Eddie Paul. He's going to uh, write down some information and, and pray for you, and he's going to take your picture as well, okay? All right, so I'll let you go with Mr. Eddie Paul. Yeah, you might need to get somebody to help you take a picture, Eddie Paul. Good, good, good. Hey, it's a joy to worship with you. I am so grateful to see God at work in your life, and I do, as we sing, where you go, I'll go, where you, um, I will follow you. I believe as you follow Jesus, as you go, as you honor Jesus, I believe there's great joy. I, bring it, I believe it. not only do you get joy, but God gets the glory. And I believe that I just pray God will continue to bless you. Hey, if you're new here, um, we won't make fun of Walmart every Sunday, so please forgive us. Um, but we'd love for you to come and join us again. We'd love for you to, if you will, stop by our welcome desk. We're there, we've got a gift we'd love to give you, as well as, and it's got some information about our church. I will invite people to stand with me again, and we'll sing the rest of the song to conclude our service. Where you 